Just sitting here grooving with the tunes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry about the long intro music and what have you, but um, I needed something to fill in the time for the uh, countdown timer, and this was the only thing I could find that was right at five minutes long. I hear it in my sleep on Sunday. <laughs> it puts me right to sleep. Anyway, uh, welcome aboard. First of all, happy Father's Day to all you daddies out there and all you grandpas and uh, great grandpas amongst us. And uh, hope you have a good day. Um, I'm not expecting a huge crowd today because it is Dad's Day. And dads want to do what dads want to do. And I'm 100% behind you there. Uh, let's see. I started out with all the best intentions in the world this week. I wanted to do a... Um, I, a, a kind of a follow-up to the previous video on importing an STL file. What I was looking for was a STL file that was two-sided, like a small statuette or something like that, that we could import both sides of that model into vCarve and Aspire and then set them up on one piece of flat stock so that we could carve both sides and then take them and glue them together so you had that one statuette. So uh, the problem has been, well, multifold actually, uh, finding the right file that didn't contain a lot of undercuts and wasn't going to be super, super, super difficult and then finding a file that I could use here on YouTube that wasn't banned from any kind of commercial use. And believe it or not, a YouTube video is considered uh, commercial use, whether you're monetized or not. So, um, and that's simply because YouTube runs ads on it for them, even if you're not, um, you know, monetized. So, um, that was one of the difficulties I had. Then, on top of all of that, um, with dental appointments and running around here, there, and everywhere, and doing a bunch of other stuff, it just, time got away from me, and I didn't get to spend as much time searching for that model as I wanted to. So, uh, Brooks, Martin, uh, yeah, you may be... Uh, you may be closer to the truth than you think. Um, and uh, Pablo, you're on the right track there. I was actually looking for a knight, the horse, and um, I just couldn't find one. I haven't searched as deep as I should, I guess. I just haven't found one that I can use um, commercially. But that was my first uh, inclination was because it's very, very popular chess pieces and, um, getting that night done, that seems to be the most difficult one. So, but I may have to look elsewhere or I may have to look super, super deep or just start uh, sending out emails to the people that create these SDL files and see if I can get, uh, you know, we can make some, uh, make some more, uh, you know, uh, make some sort of an arrangement or what have you. So, uh, yeah, Pablo, the whole thing was to try to do this on flat stock. So I didn't have to do rotary. Uh, I can do rotary, but not everybody has a rotary axis. And my whole point in doing this is to try to show people that you can do this using flat, you know, four quarter stock that's available to just about everybody. So I'll get it though. I, I will get it. I just have to, you know, like I said, just start reaching out to people and seeing if they, uh, you know, wouldn't like maybe a little traffic driven their way by putting a link in the description and sending folks their direction. Uh, lots of free files, but uh, just none that I can use commercially. So 
yet. Uh, let's see. Michael Kemont here says new music suggestion. What's he building in there by Tom Waits? Yeah, that will get me a copyright strike faster than you can say boo. And none of us want that. So, <laughs> but you know, Hey, keep them coming. All right. Let's see here. Um, let's get into some questions here. We've got several. Um, let's see. John, first off, wants to know, after converting text to curves, how do you convert back to text? The short answer is one that folks don't like to hear, and that is it depends. If you converted it to curves and then realized, no, I needed to do some other formatting or what have you, and you want to convert it back to text, um, undo. Either go up into the uh, edit menu and click undo or just hold down the control uh, key and tap the letter Z and that will undo that. Now, if you've done a bunch of things after you converted the text to curves, it will undo all those things. Um, and then you'll have to redo them after you convert back to curves. The answer nobody wants to hear is if you have saved the file, closed it, and uh, reload the file, there is no way to go back to a text object without redoing it. Um, once it's you have converted text to curves and you have saved and then closed that file, there's no way to go back. Uh, if you have not close the file even after you've saved it you can undo and i believe you can go back i don't remember how many steps you can go back by uh holding down control and tapping the letter z but every time you tap that letter z it'll undo the previous step you have done so um that's basically that once they are, um, uh, no, don't, 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 don't mistake this, Pablo. If you convert text to curves, but then you realize you need to convert it back for some reason, control Z will undo that. So, um, you know, so that you can go back and do some formatting. So, and that's whether you save it or not. Now, Peter Van Vliet has a follow-up here. Can you keep the text on one layer and then text to curves on another layer so you can always go back to the text layer in case you need to start again? Yes, you can very well do that. You can um, create your text and uh, then save that, uh, copy that text to a new layer and call it text and then turn that layer off and then work with the other and convert it to curves and do whatever you need to do. Then if you do have to go back, you have that text there. Uh, and then Sargon Tavor says, always say, I always save the file with a text version. Yes, that's a good practice to get into especially if you think that you're really going to need to get back into that text. But um, it's basically, yeah, once, now like if you import a file that has text there and there are already curves, there's no way to change them back. There is no way to change that back. Your best bet is to either writing it, writing over, or, um, you know, doing it over. Okay, John says, um, converted to curves, edited letters, then wanted to adjust kerning. Well, if, uh, if you ungroup after you have, um, if you ungroup them after you've converted to curves, you can still get in there and by hand, um, adjust that spacing in between. It's not the same as kerning using the text tools, but it's the same end result. You can still get in there and uh, move individual letters back and forth. 
But if you have all the text grouped together as one group, you can only reposition the entire group. Ungroup them so that they're all separate text, or excuse me, separate vector objects. And then you can adjust those uh, individually. Just select the letter that you want to move and uh, then use your cursor arrow keys, you know, left, right, up, down, whichever, to nudge them over. So, yeah, I mean, so let's see here. Um, see, Russell Faraday says, I copy the text to the other side, then can get it back if I need it. Yeah, that, that's another that's another option, sure. So here, let's see here. Uh, and then Garrett Frome says, uh, it is best to create a master layer in my experience. Yes, that is true. That is true. You can put everything onto another quote unquote master layer and then turn that layer off and then do all your editing on the layers that you're working with, then if you need something, it's easy to go, you know, to delete something, go back to that master layer, copy it back to the layer you just deleted that element from, and then work with that. So, and everybody has their own workflow. There, sometimes there really is no best, especially when you have seven or eight options. It's just whatever works best for you. But yeah, generally speaking, if you have if you haven't saved and closed the file after converting it to curves, you can undo and go back to uh, text object and then adjust the uh, kerning that way. Or again, as I said, just ungroup them and uh, move the individual letters that way as well. I think I, I think I showed that once in one of my videos, but I, I couldn't. I don't think I could tell you which one it was. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Um, Brooks Martin says, I milled a PVC coupler with a quarter-inch ball nose, no problem, but attempted that on acrylic. It blew up on me. Had better luck with a eighth-inch O-flute bit had some chipping with that what are your thoughts um i i gotta be honest with you brooks having never cut acrylic i really can't uh give you any thoughts just simply because anything i could say would probably be wrong uh now are you trying to cut acrylic tube or just a sheet of acrylic because uh, I have heard O-flute bits, and I've also heard um, just standard straight bits with no spiral. I've heard that also works out very well. So um, I don't know if that would help you or not. Are you trying to cut flat acrylic, or are you trying to cut an acrylic tube? And if anybody out there has any experience cutting an acrylic tube, um, what bit did you find to be the best? So, okay, uh, Brooks, you're trying to cut uh, acrylic cylinders. All right. Um, yeah, uh, Garrett makes a good point here. Sounds like the spindle too low, spindle speed too low, or not using cast acrylic. That's a good point. I don't know if acrylic cylinders are cast or extruded. I would probably... I would probably say extruded. I, I'd be willing to bet that uh, acrylic cylinders are extruded. I don't know. I don't know that for a fact. Uh, now, Todd HC and C says he's had good luck with uh, the uh, O flute of mana. Um, and they're also, uh, don't forget, there are different types of O flute bits. Some of them have the, uh, uh, the helix is set for a, uh, cutting aluminum and others have the helix set for cutting uh acrylic and i i granted it's a minor difference but that could be all the difference now from what i understand casting it excuse me carving extruded acrylic is pretty difficult 
So I, I really don't know if acrylic cylinders are cast or extruded. That's going to have to be something to look into. Uh, let's see. On the ends, feeding speeds, zero, or excuse me, 60 to 100 inches per inches per second. I assume you mean inches per minute. 18,000 spindle speed, the max for my spindle. Now, from what I gather in cutting acrylic, you don't want to run max speed. I don't know what speed to run. I've, I've, Like I said, I've not cut acrylic because I'm using a router. And while it is variable speed, I can't slow it down below about, um, I believe it's 12,500. So, yes, that was 60 to 100 inches per minute not per second, but yeah, um, that might be, uh, the, um, okay. Yeah. Todd H C and C is suggesting anywhere from 10 to 12,000. Yeah. Um, for cutting acrylic, you either have to be able to move fast in feed rate or slow down your RPM. But, um, and like I said, I've never cut acrylic, but from what I've seen and read, um, 18,000 may be too high. I don't know, depending upon your feed rate. Because the whole point is to get those chips out of there and take the heat with it. So, yeah, Garrett is saying 19,000 for an eighth inch O flute. Well, wow. Okay. All right. Well. Um, sorry, I'm not a whole heck of a lot of help, but I can't tell you what I don't know. And, uh, believe me, that's one of the things I want to get into very, very soon. Um, Todd is talking about 80 to hundred inches per minute on his machine, one eighth inch depth of cut, and that's at 10 to 12,000 inches per minute. So, okay. All right. Good to know. But that's for cast acrylic, right, Todd? He's, uh, trying to cut uh, an acrylic cylinder. So, uh, okay, Steve Russell says, Google says acrylic cylinders can be either cast or extruded. Thank you so much, Steve. And, okay, yeah, see, you're running it look, faster, Garrett. You're running at 150 inches per minute. So, yeah. Okay. All right, well, let's uh, hope something in that helps. So, <laughs> okay, um, let's get in here. H.E. says, hi, Mark. I've been recently reviewing hobbyist level CNCs and would like to know your opinion on which one to get. Ooh, loaded question. Uh, are the Chinese work bee clothes better than, let's say, long mill, shape oko, and X carve? Um, I generally speaking don't like to recommend CNC routers um, because I don't know anything about your situation. I don't know what you want to do. I don't know what your plans are for the machine. I don't know, you know, your budget. I don't know how much space you have. There are so many variables when it comes to a CNC router. I will say if you if you have never owned or operated a CNC router before, support is very important. Um, I would not. This is another one of those cases of sometimes there is no best. Um, because you can learn a lot with the inexpensive little 3018 CNC routers. It may not do everything you want it to do. It may not do most of what you want it to do. But, I mean, right now they're just a little over $150. And that's a valuable tool for learning. I can't say it's a good machine. I've never run one. I can't say it's a bad machine because I've never run one. I see people making some fantastic things with them because they have learned how to use them and they've learned the limitations of that machine and they work within the limitations. 
So a work B clone, I can't say it's better than anything. And I can't say that it's worse than anything. But if you need support after the sale, you're probably better off going with a brand that has a, a support department, B, a support community, and C, the ability to get in contact with somebody when you need them now. If you buy something through, you know, one of the uh, import sites, you're pretty much on your own unless you can find a group of people using that same machine that are willing to help you out when you have an issue. Um, just something to consider. So, um, but before you spend the first penny, figure out what you want to do and take an honest assessment. What do you want to do? How do you plan on using it? How much space do you realistically have to dedicate to that machine? Because they take up a lot of real estate. I tell people to take the cutting area of that machine and double it. And that's about how much space you're going to need to be able to operate it efficiently. Because you're going to have to be able to get material on it and off of it. You're going to have to be worry about work holding. You're going to need clearance for the machine to move and for you to move around it. And I say that as a guy who had that thing in an eight foot wide shed. And I had 16 inches between each side and the wall. So the ability to get all the way around it is important. So something to think about. So let's see here. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Andrew W says, yes, customer service on North American machines are great. Well, I, I, I'd say that, um, I'd say that, you know, that there is good and there is bad customer service. And that's universal. I mean, people are people. And sometimes they get slammed and you have to wait a long time to get a reply. But when you start throwing time zones in there and, you know, you're having a problem at two o'clock in the afternoon and your support people um, are on already on their weekend and gone, you know, it's that can be a. That can be an issue. So, <laughs> so let's see. Um, just do your research. And remember, most times you get what you pay for. Now, having said that, I have seen some killer projects come off of those little 3018 machines. And uh, to be honest, uh, my friend Dave Gatton the other day did a live stream uh, it was about a four hour live stream and I was, took part, I read comments for him and everything, but he unboxed and I mean, he cut open the box right there, opened up one of those little 3018 machines and had it assembled in about an hour and a half and played around with it, got it running and up and running. And then we just chatted with the folks and answered questions for about the last hour. And it's a fun little machine looks to be a fun little machine and i am that close to pulling the trigger on one of those little goodies because i mean well the whole thing came in one box and that box was less than 15 pounds so you know it, it's small lightweight jobby and yeah it's got limitations but what the heck i mean for 150 dollars? are you kidding me 160 dollars I mean, I've spent more on material for this. So, <laughs> so let's see here. Um, let's get to the next one here. Uh, Pablo says, to open Vectric or not to open Vectric? I don't know what you mean by that. Do you, uh, you're talking about uh, to follow along with something? Or just in general, I'm a major fan of Vectric for sure. But, uh, you know, I can't tell you to buy something and I won't tell you to buy something. So, 
Uh, let's see here. Gary Wolf says, I have three or four circles of different sizes. What is the easiest way to make them all the same size? Can it be done in one step? Um, let me go ahead and jump over here to Aspire as, as I search around for my uh, stream deck. <laughs> and let's make a couple of circles. Where's my cursor? There you are. Okay. Uh, let's make one, um, um, how big is my piece of material? Let's make one two inches in diameter, put it there. Let's make another one. Oops, no, that's radius. I want diameter. Hello. Yeah, let's make one. Um, let's make one three and let's make another one two. All right, then we'll close that. Now, is there a way, there is an easy way to make them all the same size. Can it be done in one step if you have version 11 or later? Now, uh, somebody may correct me here. This might have been introduced in 10.5. But I know for a fact in version 11, what we can do is we can select all of those Come over here to set selected object size and come right here, scale items individually. Okay. So we want to make them all, let's say 2.5. Make sure link XY is checked and you see the uh, height changes. Click apply and boom, they're all the same size. You can do that with circles, rectangles whatever. If you're using an earlier version, you'll basically have to do this all one by one. So I'll come over here to set selected object size and I'll make it 3.0. Again, link XY is selected. Click apply. Come to the next one and 3.0. Apply. Select the next one. Do them all individually. So, and it doesn't matter which box you use, as long as you have link X, Y selected. Click apply, and there you go. So, uh, it depends on which version you have. So, I hope, uh, hope that helps you out there. Let's get back over here. Uh, Steve Russell says that was introduced in version 11. Okay. I wasn't sure if I could, I, I couldn't remember if it was, uh, version 11, they introduced that or version 10.5. Um, Todd A. C and C says the circle resize gadget. I, I've never used it. And folks with, uh, the desktop version, either cut 2d or V carve desktop, they don't have uh, gadget support available. They can't use uh, gadgets at all. So uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm Nolan says I own a digital wood carver, 24 by 40. Laney Shaughnessy goes way above the call of duty to help everybody out. Laney's a good guy. Laney is a very good guy. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think you can go wrong in dealing with Laney. And you're right. He does go above and beyond for sure. Okay, let's see here. Jackie says, is it worth it for someone who knows nothing about woodworking to go for CNC work? That is a very, very loaded question. You should have some woodworking experience at least a little bit having said that there is nothing wrong with learning on the job um it's probably better if you have a little bit of experience but mainly it's not so much to do with the cnc work it's the work the prep work before you put it on the cnc and the finishing work after you take it off of the CNC. 
uh, uh, you know, you can buy a CNC router and get plastic sheet or even, um, EPS styrofoam, uh, like the blue or the pink insulation foam. And you can practice on that and learn how to use the machine on that. Um, with, uh, it, it's easy to cut and you can learn the machine, but that's not going to teach you anything about woodworking and it's not going to teach you how to finish a project. Um, I don't know. I would get into a little bit of woodworking first. Um, as far as whether it's worth it or not, what are you trying to do? I mean, if you're trying to get into this to start like a cottage business, uh, an at-home business, you might want to look around for somebody local to you who already does this and see if they need a helper and or see if they would like to maybe mentor you, take you under their wing and kind of teach you a few things. Um, look for uh, maker spaces. Look for woodworking clubs, guilds, and associations in your area. And just, you know, it, it, I was taught years ago that if you don't know how to do something, surround yourself with people who know how to do that and learn from them. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's about the best I can say. As far as whether it's worth it or not, you're the only one who can uh, make that call. I really don't know. So, um, Garrett says expect a six month learning process. That's at a minimum because, I mean, the, the learning process begins with the desire and the learning process never ends to be honest with you. And I say that as a guy who's been working with wood for over 50 years, it never ends. So by all means, if you're interested in it, the time to start is now. Yes. But you don't have to go out and buy a bunch of expensive tools. If you're just getting into, if you're serious about getting into woodworking, the absolute basics, what you need is a way to measure accurately. You need a way to cut. You need a way to join and you need a way to finish. And that can take it many, many, many forms. And you are going to have, let me uh, stop sharing here. Sorry. And it's going to be a learning curve from the very beginning. You're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. Again, I've been doing this over 50 years. I make mistakes all the time. It's learning how to focus and learning your limitations, push those limitations a little bit and get used to it. And it's just like anything else. There is no replacement for experience. And the only way to get that experience is to do it. And if you have somebody with you who can help you out, maybe guide you along the way, then, you know, I mean, I, I would never, ever tell anybody not to do it. I would just say that start with the basics and work your way up. And if that means you're using a, a uh, small wood, plastic, metal rule and a pencil and a handsaw and some nails, then so be it, you know? Um, when you think about all of the things that have ever been created, we are spoiled in that we have all this technology plus the knowledge of previous generations that we can draw from. But if you look at some of the gorgeous things that were made with basic hand tools just 150 years ago, there's no reason why you can't do that too if you want to do it and if you're willing to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. But the only way to get experience is to do it. So if you're interested, I would highly encourage it. Now, whether that means getting a CNC router, remember, it's a large investment. It's a lot of money, even for an inexpensive machine. 
but um, I don't know. Is it worth it? That's your decision to make. I mean, you may get into it and decide you don't like it. Um, and you can sell tools and sell equipment. But if you start with the basics, you're not out that much money. So, yeah. And Michael is right. Um, he had a crash course in, to learn woodworking. It takes dedication. It does if you want to get good at it. But that's the same with anything. If you want to learn a musical instrument, it takes dedication. Yeah, you know. So if you want to, I don't know, learn how to be a poker champion, it takes dedication. So if, you're, if your desire, your discipline, and your drive is there, there you go. So uh, let's see here. Uh, Tomas Sabo, joining us from Ireland, says, do you have experience with four-sided machining? No. Uh, I try to do table legs like a horse standing on its back legs, hold a tabletop with the front legs, but it's never coming out right. I do not have experience with four-sided machining, but believe me, it intrigues the stuffings out of me. For the for And yours is a perfect example. I see things like that. I know they were probably made on a rotary axis. But to me, in my way of thinking, and this is my brain on Mark, I think you could do that with a square piece of stock and flip it. I'm sure you could do it if you have the right fixture to hold the stock and flip it over. About all I can say is practice with scrap. Um, if you're, you're not in the U S so this probably doesn't help you because I don't know what kind of dimensional lumber is available in Ireland. Um, here we can get a four by four and I could clamp that down, secure it to my work table and machine one side, flip it, machine the next side, flip it. But I don't know if you have anything similar to that, something inexpensive that you can get at your local builder supply or even you know, um, on, you know, your local marketplace that somebody is getting ready to throw away to take to the landfill. Most of my practice material is free materials. I get that way. Somebody's going to take it to the landfill and I snag it and cut it up, then throw it in the landfill, but <laughs> it's just smaller pieces. Um, practice a lot in scraps. I believe if you look up YouTube, somebody has done a video on doing four-sided machining like that. But I couldn't, I, 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 I don't remember who it was. But that is something I do plan on exploring. I just got to get to it. I just got to get there. But um, let's see here. Uh, and I believe somebody answered you. I believe it was uh, Russell Faraday answered you up above. Uh, he said, yes, four-sided works fine, but the stock needs to be super accurate and square. Okay. There's the man to speak with. And if I'm not mistaken, Russell's in the UK. Hmm. Let's see here. Um, Dave Blackburn brings up a good point. He says, don't expect perfect. Yeah. Uh, perfection is uh, an abstract thing or not abstract. Perfection is subjective because what's perfect to you may not be perfect to me. So, uh, Ooh, Brooks, Martin, excellent point. Flower foam glues up well and is machinable to practice. I hadn't thought about using flower foam. Foam. Hmm. Hmm. Might be, might, might be interesting. I might have to play with that. Okay. Um, uh, John Thompson says, how about the guy that made the koi fish? Was that the one? I think, was that the one? Uh, yeah, uh, Peter Von Hoof. I believe his first name was Peter. I may be wrong. I may be confusing him with somebody else. Um. But yeah, he uses, if I'm not mistaken, he uses a shape, shape Oko. Dennis Van Hoof. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Dennis Van Hoof. Look him up on YouTube. There you go. For four-sided machining, 
look up Dennis Van Hoof. In fact, I'm going to write myself a note right now. Dennis Van Hoof. And I will link his YouTube channel in the description of this video. You guys, if you have never seen any of his videos, the man, well, he cheeses me off, number one, because it's like nobody likes a smart aleck, and you're really being a smart aleck here. You know that? <laughs> the guy is a wizard. I'm not kidding you. And, yes, I know my eyes just got real big. When you look at the stuff he makes on his little, I believe it's a shape Oko. It's been a while since I've watched one of his videos. But when you see what he makes on that machine, your jaw's going to drop. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. It's, it's, it's something to be seen. And I will go find his channel and link it in the description of this one as soon as we're finished live here. Yeah, he's a wizard. So, uh, yes, he did the Xenomorph Alien from the movie Alien. And it was just like, are you kidding me? And that's the one that cheesed me off, Blake. <laughs> it's like, okay, nobody likes a smart aleck. You're just showing off now. Quit it. We know you're a wizard. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Tomas says, I have lots of palette material that I can glue together. Just be careful with palette material. Watch out for any kind of dirt, gravel, metal fasteners. You know that. Just uh, I have a love-hate relationship with pallet wood. I mean, I love that people are doing something with it and keeping it out of the landfill. I think that's great. But I hate working with it myself. So. Um, Percy Kuka says, I'm in my third year owning a CNC. I've lost close to $1,500 making mistakes. It happens. But today I'm getting ready to install my second machine. Well, good, good. And let's hope that those lessons, make those mistakes, were lessons. If you learn from those mistakes, I mean, mistakes are going to happen. They just will. It, and there's nothing you or I can do to change that. They are going to happen. If you learn from the mistake, you know, um, then that turns it around. That, that turns it right around. So, okay. I think I'm caught up with questions. Did I miss anybody? Um, let's see here. Uh, Pablo says, would you believe I need to find out how to cut paper or cardboard with a laser? I'm not the man. I am not the man to talk to you about that. So, um. Russell Faraday says, the man who never made a mistake never made anything. I don't know about that. I made a lot of mistakes and not made a thing. <laughs> so it just depends <laughs> on what you're talking about, you know. I can make a, I can make a mistake tying my shoes in the morning. So. <laughs> so do we have uh, any other questions here? I mean, we're 10 minutes to the top of the hour. And it's let me get on my soapbox for a minute there on a related note. I have seen some folks, I don't think any of y'all in here, but I have seen some folks make comments on, you know, beginners groups on Facebook and things like that, that are saying things like, well, if you're not breaking bits, you're not learning. And I really wish we would stop that because in my brain, I'm thinking, well, using that logic, you don't know how to drive until you've totaled four cars. And that's just ridiculous because I can break bits all day and not learn a thing. The thing is to stop and figure out why that bit broke, because that's not normal. If you're breaking bits, something is wrong. Stop and analyze it. Are you trying to cut too deep? Are you trying to cut too fast? Is your RPM too slow? Are you using the wrong bit for the material you're cutting? Not all bits are the same. Not all materials are the same. They're completely, it's, it's a completely different situation based on the material that you're using. Um, Eric Gautier's got it right. Bits are expensive. And, you know, they are, yes, they are a consumable item. Yes, they will dull. And yes, they will eventually need to be replaced. But breaking bits 
is not normal. If you are trying to follow the feeds and speeds of recommended by the bit manufacturer, it's possible that your machine just isn't capable of doing that. It's like my GAT and CNC. Excellent machine. Have no regrets in building it at all. But because it's lead screw, it's five start lead screw driven, it doesn't have the speed to be able to get some of the chip loads that some of the bit manufacturers uh, are recommending. It doesn't, well, I can get the chip load, but I can't use their feeds and speeds. So I have to play around with it. You know, um, that's why I, I start with conservative numbers and then speed up my feed rate or slow down my feed rate as it's cutting. Now, I use Mach 3, so Mach 3 lets me do that. Not every control software will let you do that, let you increase or decrease the feed rate. But I start conservative, see how it's cutting, sp start speeding up the feed rate until I get a little bit of chatter, then I start backing it down till that chatter goes away. So it's uh, it's kind of a balancing act. But uh, if you are breaking bits, there's a problem. So uh, let's see here. And Garrett Frome is 100% accurate here. Accurate here. Different materials affect speeds and feeds as well, as well as the rigidity of your machine. Uh, are you using a router versus a spindle? Can you control the RPMs with your software and maybe speed up the RPMs if the bit is struggling a little bit? Um, maybe you can uh, speed up the feed rate or slow down the feed rate if the bit is struggling. Because remember, it's supposed to cut the wood, not try to plow through it. So th there are a lot of variables. So stop, kind of analyze, try to figure out why did that break? Am I cutting too fast? Am I cutting too deep? You know, because let's face it, a lot of these machines just aren't capable of doing something that a shop saver can do. So, ah, uh, let's see here. Uh, I am not even going to attempt to, to, <laughs> to talk about that username. I'm just going to call you the oval lampshade. Uh, where can you get creative clamping tools or two desi tool designs from for the spoil board? Just, um, boy, look around. They can take the, they can run the gamut. I mean, basically there are the, the basic ways of work holding, which I plan on getting into, um, are side pressure, down pressure. And that's about it. So you're talking about side pressure. That could be anything from a vice to uh, small horizontal press clamps to um, cam clamps. If you're talking about top pressure, that could be anything from screw down clamps to toggle clamps to screws. Okay, there's a third method, and that is adhesive. You know, I mean, so you look at double sided tape or uh, tape and CA glue, which I prefer over double sided tape, but that's just me. Um, as far as different clamps and clamping types, just look around. I mean, if you look on YouTube or just do a Google search for CNC work holding, you will have more ideas than you want, believe me, <laughs> because everybody and their brother has their own favorite. But I would caution you by saying there is no single perfect solution and every project is going to be different. You know, um, you may have um, clamping down a piece of material to carve a sign is going to be completely different from clamping down a jewelry box to engrave a name on it, which is going to be completely different from um surface mounting a sheet of eighth inch thick material to cut small pieces out of, which is going to be completely different from trying to mill aluminum. So, um, 
you know, it, 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 there is no one single answer. Uh, so don't dedicate your entire spoil board to just one option. Leave yourself open to options. So, uh, you know, I totally forgot about that uh, vac fink. He's a fan of vacuum holding on his CNC. Yeah, you sure can use, uh, you can make vacuum pods that will fit certain sizes. Like if you do a lot of one particular size or something close, you can make a small vacuum pod that you can mount on your table and, you know, kick on the vacuum pump, cut that one, turn it off, lift that one off, put a new one on and go for it. So, uh, Eric Gauthier says, I'm moving towards lower profile cam clamps. The only bits I've ever broken were because I caught a knob or handle of a normal hold down. And that's why I'm a fan of surface mounting myself. I use tape and CA glue or screws or both. Um, so, but I, I have used, uh, I have used uh, clamps and clamping fixtures. Um, don't know if you can see it. No, I moved it. You can't see it. I had a clamping fixture down below, but I, I moved it. It's off somewhere else. Okay. Uh, Michael Kimont says I use threaded inserts a lot. Yeah, there's another option. I've seen people that have threaded inserts and T-Track. So I went with just T-Track, but that was mainly for me to mount fixtures to hold other, uh, work. So. Um, let's see here. Jeff Woodywan says, where can I get V bit sharpened? Look for a, uh, do a Google search in your area for saw sharpening. Most of the companies that can sharpen saw blades, uh, can sharpen bits, hit a couple of local cabinet shops or furniture shops or woodworking shops and ask them to refer you to a sharpener. Um, and it, depending upon the number of uh, flutes, there's a nominal fee. I think here the lo our local guy charges like six dollars. So you don't have to have a bit sharpened too many times before it becomes just you might as well get a new one. So um, just know that. Now, if you just need to dress it up and it doesn't need regrinding, you can do it yourself with a. Uh, a um, diamond uh, hone. Um, Peter Pasuelo did a video on doing just that uh, over on his channel, CNC Nuts. And I will link his video as soon as we're done uh, live here. Uh, sharpen V bits. He did an excellent video a few years ago on doing just this. And, um, he's, uh, it, it, it's, it's really a good video. I'll put a link to that video in the description of this as soon as we're finished. Uh, and VacFink says he also did a great video for making a table size vacuum holding system. Yes. Yes, he did. He did. That's right. And, uh, well, let me put it this way. If you are not subscribe to Peter Pasuelo over at his uh, YouTube channel, CNC Nuts. Get over there and do it. Get over there and do it. So, uh, Lewis Denton wants to know what terminology is used for sizes of vacuum pumps. I'm going to have to claim ignorance. I really don't know. I don't have a, uh, I don't have a, uh, vacuum pump and I, I, I really am a newbie at it. I, I don't know. Okay, I'm going to take this one as the last question for today, and that's from Oval Lampshade. I am George from Barbados. Hello, George. Uh, are legacy CNC machines recommended? I know several people that own legacy CNCs, and they would certainly recommend them. But I also know people with Laguna CNCs that would recommend them. I know people with Onefinity CNCs that would recommend them. You get my point. Legacy is a good brand. Legacy is a very good brand. Um, but yeah, just about everybody who owns a CNC would recommend the CNC they own. I mean, of course they are. You ask somebody what their favorite car is, they'll tell you the one they own. So, um, but yeah, Legacy is a good brand. So, 
Alrighty. Um, yes, I agree. Uh, CNC nuts is great. And uh, he does use the Mazo. That is true. The Mazo controller. Um, yeah, I think Peter's was the first CNC channel I ever subscribed to. It was before I even met Dave Gatton because I was looking at a website um, following a guy on YouTube named Patrick Hood Daniel who later went on to uh, run the company Build Your CNC. And um, I had no doubt that I could build the structure. It's just I'm not an electronics guy. So the electronics always mystified me. And I'll be honest with you, there's still to me a little bit of mystical voodoo and all that, that you could do all this stuff just by regulating which direction electricity runs. So, um, you know, I could, I figured I could build the structure, but I didn't know a thing about electronics. So all that was, uh, you know, voodoo to me. And, Dave Gatton, I met him and he introduced me to the plug and play system and the rest, as they say, is history. So, uh, but Peter, I was looking at his videos simply because he put everything in layman's terms. And while other people were talking about these things that were way over my head and sounding a lot like, you know, seagulls fighting over a sandwich. <laughs> and, you know, way over my head, Peter broke it down and, uh, I understood him. And, um, so yeah. Uh, see Thomas Grimm says Peter has not been doing much new stuff, but listening to his backlist is really productive. Oh yeah. He's got a lot of good content over there. Much, much good time content. Okay. We're going to go ahead and back it out of here. I'm going to keep trying on the uh, two-sided uh, STL file um, import. And um, let's see here. Brooks Martin, you are the man, the myth, the legend. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Um, you, guys are, you guys are the best. Thank you for your support, and thank you for all of your help. So, um, I can't guarantee that video will be out next week. Film at 11. Watch this space. Uh, channel members, Lewis Denton, I'm talking to you and a few other folks in here. Um, let's see. Uh, Steve Russell, John Thompson, all the rest of you. You know who you are. Don't forget tomorrow's members only live stream. The link is on my community tab. Uh, go to my page, hit the community tab. There's the link. I'll see you tomorrow night at, uh, five 30 Pacific, eight 30 Eastern. And other than that, um, I'm running it through my brain. Is that it? That's it. I'll get these links in the description as soon as we're done here. Have a great father's day. Um, and go do something cool. Go make some chips. Go on, get out of here. I'm turning off the lights. Y'all take care. <laughs> See you next week, y'all.